All right, let's go ahead and start and turn to Galatians chapter 1. Our topic here is the word, in the, the word of God and the gospel, and we're showing how the word of God is necessary for preaching the gospel and necessary for the salvation of man. You can turn to Galatians chapter 1 to start with. I want to ask you a question. How important is a plant? <laughs> they might think this is odd. I thought you were talking about the Word of God. Okay. Well, I love plants. And plants are very important to us, mankind. Because... Well, there's several reasons. The chief reason why plants are so important is food. We need food to eat. Okay? So we need plants. We need plants to be around for food. Another reason why we need plants is oxygen. They produce the oxygen that we breathe. So God has created plants with this system that we provide them the air, they provide us the air. So there's this back and forth motion that plants are needed. And then we need plants for medicine, for building buildings. We cut down plants to build buildings. We need plants for a lot of important things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, another question, what does a plant need to live? Water. Water! <laughs> All plants need water first to sprout and then to grow, okay? And so, if we cherish plants, what are we going to do? We're going to water them. We're going to give them what they need to sprout and grow because we need them. They're so important to us, okay? Now, let's look at Galatians chapter 1. It says in verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So what we're seeing here in the early times after Christ ascended is that the gospel was already being perverted. It was already being attacked in so many ways. And we go to 2 Corinthians, just a few pages, 2 Corinthians 11, again we see this message again, that the gospel is being perverted. In verse 3 it says, But I fear... Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind shall be, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For, we have, for he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received. Or another gospel, which ye have not accepted. Ye might well bear with him. So again, there we see another gospel. So the gospel is being perverted in these early times, in these early churches, yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. This is very serious. Mm -hmm. It's very serious because we want a true gospel. And in order to have a true gospel, you need a scriptural gospel. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? You have to, the gospel must be what scripture says the gospel is. Amen. Okay. What the scriptures say the gospel is, that's what the gospel is. Anything different is not the gospel. That's just the basic. So anything short of that is a false gospel. And we know there's only one gospel. As Ephesians 4 says, there's only one faith. There's one Lord. So, if we're going to have all this one gospel, this true gospel, this scriptural gospel, there's, there's certain aspects that need to come into consideration to make sure that it's a true gospel. You need the right interpretation of Scripture. You need to interpret Scripture correctly. In order to protect the gospel from being perverted, from being changed from what it should be, you need to protect 
the right interpretation of scripture, mm -hmm. which is contextual, grammatical, and historical. Mm -hmm. It has to be exactly what the scriptures say. Yep. If you veer off of that, you get into something that's corrupted. Mm -hmm. Need sound theology. You can't preach something that is that is contrary to the doctrine of scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, for instance, okay, you can't preach that Jesus is not God. You have to preach that Jesus is God because that's what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. And right. you know, second second John <laughs> warns us of this, that you know the doctrine of Christ is very important. And if mm -hmm. you corrupt that, if you don't have a sound theology, well you're going to pervert the gospel too. Mm -hmm. So that the theology is very important there. And then you need a high standard. I know we live in days where the gospel is very watered down. It's, it's perverted to a point where it's so shallow, it's just so surface, and you can't really discern what it is. But uh, that high standard has been lowered by our culture, lowered by the age that we live in, and that high standard is not upheld. Whereas scripture holds a high standard for what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. We need to have a high standard. And then we need God's words. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. We need, God, we need God's words to protect the gospel from being perverted. And what we see in these days is a lot of shallowness, a lot of silliness, really. Mm -hmm. Just being very silly with the word of God. Being very silly with the doctrine that we believe. It's not taking it seriously. And it just seems like it's just going, it's just going out the window. And... When we read through scripture, we see that in 1 Corinthians 4, that the apostles, they considered what they had, as far as their message, to be something very, very important. Paul said this, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards mm -hmm. of the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Amen. We are stewards of what we've been given. We're here to protect this. And if we don't protect this, if we don't have all the components for the gospel, we're going to move into something that is not sound with scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we need the scriptures. It's, it's necessary. The necessity of the scriptures. We have to preach the gospel with the scriptures. Why? Well, we go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul said this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures okay he states that because you can't have the gospel without the scriptures mm -hmm. that's good mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so on what grounds when, why did Christ die why was he buried why did he resurrect because of the Old Testament prophecies because of the scriptures in the Old Testament. Amen. They were prophesied way beforehand, and we get into the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those prophecies. Mm -hmm. So we need the scriptures. And Paul says here, it was according to the scriptures. It's very important that we have the scriptures underlying the gospel that we preach. Mm -hmm. And so what was Paul's gospel? It was the Old Testament scriptures. It had to be the scriptures because the gospel he preached was groundless without the prophecies spoken long beforehand. Mm -hmm. the, gospel in the, the gospel in the Old Testament times was all the prophecies of the Messiah. And we, we've said it this way, they're looking forward to the Messiah. <coughs> and all these prophecies are projecting us to the salvation Jesus who is coming. And when we come to the New Testament, <coughs> we're looking back at all the prophecies that have been fulfilled. And we're saying, this is the one. We need to believe in him. 
Okay, and he says something similar, again, in Romans 1, 1 and 2. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Okay? Of course, he puts that in parentheses. Just so we know, it's in the Holy Scriptures. This is not some man, this is not man's opinion. This is what God has given us, what God has spoken. Okay, so there we see, again, the Holy Scriptures are important. Jesus said in Luke 24, 44 through 47, he mentioned, well, I'll just read what he said. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Well, that covers all of the Old Testament. Concerning me. Okay. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So here we see a correlation between the Old Testament scriptures and the gospel that we preach. They go together. You can't have one without the other. You need to have the scriptures to support the gospel that you preach. Okay. So here we see all three divisions of the Old Testament that speak and wrote of Jesus, and he fulfilled the prophecies. <clears throat> you see that word written. Okay? This is written word. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that later. That it, This is written word. Mm -hmm. Now, we see here that Christ gave instruction to his disciples. He, he goes through all the Old Testament scriptures. We don't know how many hours this could have been. Okay? He mm -hmm. goes through all the Old Testament scriptures, expounding and expanding their understanding of who he is and how he fulfilled them. And then he says to them, go preach it. Yeah. <laughs> now go preach what I just told you. Yeah. Okay? So, on a root level, the scriptures are necessary for the gospel. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about regeneration. It's necessary that we preach the scriptures for a regeneration of man from for men's souls, what we call the new birth. Paul said that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation in Romans 1, 1 16. Okay? But if we go to James 1 18, there James says, Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth. It's very plain right there. We're begotten by the word of truth. That's good. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to... Do I need to explain it? <laughs> okay. here, here we go again. 1 Peter 1.23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then he goes on to say in verse 25, And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Explains. He, he summarizes it. What he's talking about there. The word of God that gave you new birth. Okay? That was the gospel that we were preaching to you. Okay? And what were we preaching to you? The word of God. What was the word of God that we were preaching to you? The gospel. Okay? So, in order for regeneration to happen, a person must hear and respond to the words of God. Now, um, this is not on my slides, but I wanted to kind of include this. When Jesus spoke in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of John, he said that his words quicken. He said in John 6.63 that they are life. Mm -hmm. They are life. They give life. Mm -hmm. In John 4, Jesus talked about the water of life, and then all these scores of people started 
flooding to Jesus. And what did he do? Well, it says, and many more believe because of his own word. <clears throat> He's preaching to them <laughs> words. Of course, he's God. He's preaching God's word. Okay. Mm -hmm. So his words are giving life. And was it not Jesus' words that raised the ruler's daughter, yeah. the widow's son at Nain, and raised Lazarus from the tomb? Mm -hmm. His words at every level give life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Talk about response. People's response to the gospel. First Thessalonians chapter two. We see that we go to, into chapter one. We see that what Paul is preaching there is the gospel. But you go you go further down into the context of his whole explanation of what he preached to them. It gets to verse thirteen. He says, "For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because." When ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God would effectually work also in you that believe. Paul regarded his preaching to be both the gospel and the word of God. What was he preaching? He was preaching the word of God. And this is, this is what these Thessalonians received. They responded to. They responded to the gospel, but what were they responding to? The word of God preached to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there we see the word of God. How about spiritual strongholds? You know, when we do evangelism, especially in this area that we live in, there's a lot of strongholds that we deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of, as I like to explain, it's like a spider web. You just, it's, you're just walking through all kinds of just things going all over the place, can't discern what people are thinking, it's just everything's messed up, okay? And so, how do we combat, how do we, how do we conquer these strongholds? Well, in Ephesians 6, it says in 6.17 that the Word of God Amen. is the sword of the Spirit, okay? And there it says in that passage that we're supposed to take on the armor, we're supposed to stand fast and to work against the powers of darkness. And how are, what is our weapon? It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then he says in verse 19, he goes on and says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what context is he talking about? He's talking about his evangelism yep. of the gospel. Yep. And what is he using? What is his weapon? Mm -hmm. The word of God. Right. Now to go further with this, the word for word is rhema. Okay? Mm -hmm. The other word for word that would be in the New Testament is logos. But here it's rhema. Okay? Rhema is very particular and it and it, dub, it parallels with the idea of the sword. Mm -hmm. Okay? The idea of the sword there is something very small. Mm -hmm. Something with hand-to-hand um, -hand combat. Something with close combat, man-to-man -man combat. And what they would do is take out this hidden sword that was sheathed on their belt. They would take it out and they would stab it into the gut. Stab it into the stomach. Okay? Close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's to pierce something particular. Well, when we talk about the word rhema, this is something specific. Logos is more general. Okay? But rhema is something, a specific saying, a specific section of the word of God. And that's to pinpoint, that's to target the stronghold. That's good. There we go. And so what does that mean? Well, this includes quotations of scripture. Yeah the particular scriptures that deal with the problem. And there's many problems in this world. There's many false doctrines. And what do you have to use to conquer these strongholds that, so that people can see their problem and see where they need to repent? Mm -hmm. You need to use scripture. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's particular scriptures that target the problem. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
And that's what he meant, boldly preach the gospel. Because when you, when you target people's problems, they're not going to like it. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Okay? <laughs> Believe me, I know. They're not going to like it. And so what does Paul need? He needs the saints praying for him. He needs people praying for him that he would, may boldly speak. Because it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many times he was threatened with death. Mm -hmm. We're not. Belief. Faith. Okay? When we talk about faith here in uh, Romans 10, Paul talks about the word of faith. And he talks about the Gentiles receiving the Word of God, okay? And he goes on with these series of questions, and uh, why, why don't you turn there? It's a long passage that Paul is dealing with these Jews who didn't like the fact that Gentiles can be saved. So he's dealing with that argument, dealing with the Jews, thinking on that, with the whole scope of God's plan. But he says in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how, the, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for... Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay? So he's answering this argument that Jews may have. How, how can Gentiles deserve the privilege of salvation? Okay? And how can they know? They haven't heard. Well, this where Paul comes in. Well, Jesus sent me to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like that. Well, that's what Jesus told me to do. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? Paul's point was that the Lord sent him to the Gentiles to preach the gospel of Christ, and it was beautiful. But the Jews were arguing with them, saying, how, can, how, how is that possible? Okay? Well, it's because he rejected it. Okay? But uh, his point was that these Gentiles cannot believe unless the word of God is preached to them. So that's why Paul was sent to them, to preach the word of God. To preach the gospel to them. How can they believe something they, they don't know? That's why Paul was sent to them. So that they can be saved. Mm -hmm. Don't you want them to be saved, Jews? Okay? And so then faith comes by hearing. You hear by the word of God. They have to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. In order for them to believe. And that's why Paul was sent. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is a, what's the point? We have to preach the word of God. If we want people to believe in the gospel, they have to know what it is. Mm -hmm. In order to believe in Jesus, you have to know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, now. Is this what we see? Well, we need to take a walk with the apostles. Mm -hmm. okay? Not a literal walk, but we're going to take a walk with the apostles and see what they did. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, this to his disciples. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word. Mm -hmm. So they were sent to preach the gospel. Amen. But what were they preaching? The word. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they preached everywhere. There was no demographic. They yeah. preached everywhere. Yeah. When Jesus taught his disciples, his disciples came to him, hey, we don't understand the parable of the soils. Can you explain it to us? Mm -hmm. Well, in that parable of the soils, he said that the seed is the word of God. Mm -hmm. What well, are they to scatter? Mm -hmm. The word of God. Mm -hmm. What well, are they to preach? To men, the word of God. It's very plain and simple there. Now, so, is this what Christ's disciples did? Did they do this? Say, of course. Okay? 
Let's look at the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost. This is Acts chapter 2. We're going to take a walk with, its, with the apostles. Let's see what they did. Now I'm not going to read the whole passage here. I think you pretty you you know this story pretty well. Okay? The Holy Spirit comes and everyone's amazed. They're wondering what's going on. Well, Peter gives this message. Well, in his message, he quotes different scriptures that pinpoint his audience. He quoted Joel 2, 28-32. He quoted Psalm 16, 8-11. You just walk through the passage, he's quoting Joel, Psalms. He's, he quoted Psalm 110, 1. And it says in Acts 2, 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They received his word. Well, what were they receiving? They were receiving the prophecy of Joel, receiving the prophecy in Psalms, all these prophecies about Jesus. They re were receiving the word of God. Mm -hmm. Believing it. It was the gospel through the Old Testament scriptures. Okay? We'll get to that, but we go to uh, Acts 3. We see that uh, Paul preached again, and he quotes Psalm 22, he quotes Isaiah 53, he quotes Deuteronomy 18. He's just giving all these quotations from the Old Testament to show that this is what you need to believe. Mm -hmm. This is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Believe it. When you go to the message of Stephen, what does Stephen do? He just gives the whole history. Yes. He just gives the whole history of Israel, and it comes to the focal point, says... You rejected the Messiah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, what did he do? He preached all the scriptures. And he came to a head point. You rejected your Messiah. That's what Stephen did. The message to the Samaritans in Acts 8. We see that Philip traveled through all Samaria. We see in verse 4 of Acts 8 that... He was preaching the word. Mm -hmm. And in verse 14, the Samaritans received the word of God. Mm -hmm. And then Peter and John come, come on by. And what do they do? <laughs> they preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Verse 25. They preach the gospel. Okay? They were preaching the word of God. It's what Philip did. It's what Peter and John did. They were preaching the word of God all okay. the way through. There's a good story. Mm -hmm. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. okay, the spirit takes Philip to this desert place where this, Ethiop this man of Ethiopia is. And he's traveling through on his chariot. And he's reading a scroll. Okay. And what is he reading? Well, he's reading Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. And then what does Philip do? They say, oh, close up, close that up. Let me tell you something. Okay? Mm -hmm. No. He probably takes the scroll. And he says, then it says, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture mm -hmm. and preached unto him Jesus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was using the scripture that this man was reading to preach to him the gospel. Mm -hmm. Very clear. <clears throat> Paul in the synagogues. In Antioch, we see that uh, there, he's on the Sabbath day, and the Gentiles were the ones who were wanting to hear. But what were they, were they wanting to hear? Well, it says in verse 44 that they were wanting to hear, this is Acts 13. They were wanting to hear the Word of God. A man speak? No. Want to hear a philosopher? No. They want to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted. And so, let's go on. Go to Thessalonica. Paul entered into the synagogue of the Jews. And there, says that he reasoned with them. This is Acts 17 says that he reasoned with them, verse 2, 
out of the scriptures. <coughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and ri risen again from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that this Jesus, who I preach unto you, is Christ. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. That's verse 2. Out of the scriptures. So he's bringing the scriptures out and he's preaching the gospel. He's elaborating. He's, he's, he's taking the scriptures and he's telling, this is the gospel. Berea. This is um, going further in Acts 17. He moves on to Berea. And what does he do? Well, it says the word of God was preached. Verse 13. Okay. And what do the Berean people do? They search the scriptures. Amen. Then they Verse 11, they searched the scriptures. Paul came with the scriptures and they were searching the scriptures because they wanted to know the gospel. Paul at Corinth, he stayed for a year and a half. And what was he doing? In verse, this is chapter 18, verse 11, it says, and he continued there a year and six months Teaching the word of God among them for a year and a half. Teaching the word of God. Okay? This wasn't your five minute presentation. Apollos. We go further in Acts here. Verse 28. What was Apollos doing? Of course, he had to be uh, realigned by Aquila and Priscilla, but after he's realigned and he sees things more perfectly, says in verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. By the scriptures. Okay? Paul in Rome. You get to the end of Acts, the very last chapter of Acts, Paul is on his way to Rome and he travels all the way to Rome and he's, he's, uh, he's arrested and he's chained to a soldier, okay? And he, he can't really do much. Hey, people can visit him. But what is he doing there in Rome? He was arrested, sent to Rome where the government kept him with a soldier. Some Jews heard about him and wanted to hear what Paul had to preach. Well, what did he preach? We'll look at verse 23. It says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Okay? He's going through all the law of Moses and all through the prophets to show that Jesus is the Christ. He's going through the scriptures from morning till evening. It's a long time. This is just a morning. <laughs> but what was he doing? He's preaching the kingdom. We see this in verse 31. What do we, what's the last thing we know about Paul in Acts? He's preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know what he did. He preached from the scriptures. Yeah. Okay? So, I want to talk about some shameful alter alternatives. We know, we, we've seen this, we see that the Word of God is necessary for our preaching of the Gospel. And it's necessary for regeneration of, of, man, of men's souls. But there are some shameful alter alternatives in this world which um, undermine this teaching that we're looking at here. One that I want to talk about is easy believism, okay? So, before I get to that, I want to just make a statement about John the Baptist. I'm, I'm preaching through the book of Luke in my Bible class for my, my class in the school. And uh, going through John the Baptist, these people come to John the Baptist, want to be baptized, and John the Baptist says, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait. I know why you're coming. You're just coming just to escape the, the wrath of God. You're not really coming to repent. You're just coming to ex escape like snakes, coming to escape, escaping fire. Okay? 
It says, okay, why are you, this is why you're here. And then they say, well, John, what should we do? Okay. Well, it says, well, you need to repent from this, repent from this, repent from this, repent from this, okay? And so, Amen. when John the Baptist preached, he was no softy. He was no one, two, three, pray with me guy. Okay? He was very adamant that people truly repent and people truly believe what the scriptures say about the Messiah. They can't just come and say, I prayed a prayer. I'm good. Okay? But there's this easy believism out there, and it's just, say, it's a five-minute gospel presentation, and they say, pray with me. Great, you're saved. We have another soul saved. That's 1,001. Okay? Let's baptize him. But what it's doing is, it's neglecting the expounding of the scriptures to give this deep understanding of what the gospel is. These people are saying they... They're saying that these people are believing something, but they're not believing what the scriptures say about the gospel because it's not being presented. <coughs> right. They're just giving a five-minute presentation and voila, magic, you're saved. Not true. But it's downgrading, it's, it's, it's diminishing the word of God, it's making the gospel very shallow, where it's, it's really just kicking the word of God out the door. Mm -hmm. Don't need it. Mm -hmm. Don't need it. Okay? And that's just... There's many reasons why people go with this method, but I'm not dealing with that. Church growth strategies. There's many of these. Okay? Um, you got the secret section, you know, the rock concerts and all that. You know, all these things that people do these days in these churches. You got the invitation philosophy. You just bring everyone to a meeting and Ooh, they'll be saved, okay? Or these activities that people do, okay? All these fun, act, fun oriented activities. And what they're doing is they're, they're putting the Word of God on the back burner, so to speak. And they're maximizing on all these activities, maximizing on all these strategies, thinking that that's what's going to save people. That doesn't, it's not, that, those don't save, it's the Word of God that saves people, it's the Gospel that saves people, not these strategies. Okay? Mm -hmm. But they, they want to, to pour all their time, all their resources into these strategies, thinking that's the key. That's the key to people's conversions. It's not. It's very simple in Scripture. It's the Word of God. It's the Gospel. Amen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Lifestyle evangelism. You know, people... This is very similar to the last two. Uh, people believe that I don't need to preach the gospel. I don't need to preach it. I don't need to open the scriptures. If people just see my testimony, see my lifestyle, mm -hmm. they might come around and believe. You know, you know, if they just see what I, what I do to see the grace of God. You know, and see my loving attitude and see all that. They might believe. Okay. Well, but there, there again, we're kicking out the word of God, saying it's not necessary for the salvation of men is that softness to the message yeah. mm -hmm. and what tends to happen is a worldliness yeah. what tends to happen is right. that people get confused on what the gospel is because they're seeing the lifestyle of these people and they're thinking oh I guess that's what the gospel does mm -hmm. you can be worldly and, and be called a Christian Okay, so now they're confused. You're not opening the scriptures to show them what the true gospel is. You're just using your lifestyle to preach the gospel. That's not what the scriptures say. Not that your lifestyle has no impact. Our lifestyles do have impact. Our lifestyles do show the, the effects of the gospel. But we still need to preach the word of God. Amen. And... Uh, what tends to happen is, you know, you want to keep these relationships, you want to keep these fellowships with these worldly people so they be saved. What tends to happen is, you don't talk about those difficult things that people really need to hear, mm -hmm. which is what John the Baptist would do. Right. Okay? 
They take out those difficult parts of the gospel and say, eh, we're going to take that out, we're going to take that out, we're going to take that out. You just need to know this. That's not what the gospel is. So, we have lifestyle evangelism. Another one is the social gospel. That's out there. And this comes from a theology that is obviously not sound in Scripture. But it pushes an agenda to solve the world's problems, these social problems such as racism, alcohol, alcohol crime, poverty, all these kinds of problems in the world. And they're saying that social programs, government programs, are what's going to change it. That's not true. Okay? What the Bible says is that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. No. Mm. Right. The word of God is the power of God. Mm. Not these social programs. But they somehow think, because of their theology, of course, that these programs are going to change people. Well, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.18 and uh, 2, 4, and 5 that his preaching of Jesus and the cross was the power of God to save those Corinthians. And then later on he says in chapter 6, 9 through 11, he stated that some of them were fornicators, idolaters, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, drunkards, and such, which is what the social, <laughs> social, social gospel is trying to fix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how did Paul fix those problems, mm -hmm. the preaching of the cross. Mm -hmm. That's the only solution. Mm -hmm. It's not these programs that are what we call reforming. Okay, They may reform the outside. They may get people to stop alcohol maybe for a couple of years, but it doesn't really deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is a spiritual problem on right. the inside. And that's something mm -hmm. that the Word of God can do. Okay, another um, thing out there is regeneration precedes faith. Mm -hmm. You know, Calvinists will say this, that regeneration precedes faith, meaning that an unbeliever cannot believe until God has rege regenerated his soul. We know that regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we see this in Titus chapter 3. But how does the Spirit regenerate? Okay? Well, Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. As recently mentioned, 2 Timothy, well I haven't gotten to that, but 2 Timothy refers to the scriptures making people wise to salvation. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that. But when we were explaining Ephesians 6.17, it says it's the sword of the Spirit. So what does the Spirit use? He uses the Word of God to convict men's souls to regenerate them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we said, we saw in 1 Peter 1, that the Word of God lives and abides forever. So the Spirit uses the preaching of God's Word and the Gospel to bring new life to a person's soul. On the basis of his repentance and faith in the Gospel, we see this in Acts 2.41, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, but there's one other scripture I want to point out to you. Because it, they, they're saying regeneration precedes faith. Mm -hmm. So that person has to be regenerated in, in order to believe. Mm -hmm. But really, when you, when you walk through scripture, you see that regeneration, the work of the Holy Spirit, and faith and repentance are all lumped together. Mm -hmm. They all happen mm -hmm. almost at, right at the same time. And they work together. <laughs> Think of Hebrews 4.2. You can turn to Hebrews 4.2. <clears throat> there the writer is talking about the Jews in the wilderness who didn't believe. And so they didn't enter into God's rest. Well, why? Okay, it says, For unto you us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay? So, people may hear the word of God, but it has to be mixed with faith. So the word was preached. The word, the, the Spirit administers the word through His ministers, 
The Word can give life. But there's no regeneration, no salvation, unless the person receives, responds in faith and repentance to receive the Word that's given to him. Okay? So, regeneration precedes faith. You know, we need the Word of God, and the Word of God provides regeneration, but people need to believe it. Baptismal regeneration, that's out there. There's groups out there that say that baptism regenerates a person. And that is necessary for salvation. Well, you go to 1 Corinthians 1.17, and I, I would encourage you to turn there. Paul actually makes a <laughs> distinction between the gospel and baptism. He makes a distinction right. that they're two separate things. <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians 1.17. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. There, there, it's very plain there. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So what is the power of God? Is it the baptism? No. It's the preaching of the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what regenerates. Mm -hmm. Not the baptism. And so, when he goes on in chapter 2, and he says in uh, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Okay, and then, then he says in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Okay, so not only are we talking about baptism, I mean, our faith doesn't stand in our baptism, nor does it stand in the wisdom of men, the opinion of men. Okay? Mm -hmm. The gospel that we're preaching is not our own words. It's the words of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's not a work. Okay? We're not preaching works here. Amen. We're not preaching baptism. Baptism is, is a work. We're not preaching works here. And the, the Bible is very clear that we're not saved by works. We're not. Read through Romans, read through Ephesians, read, read through, through the whole New Testament. We're not saved by works. Baptism is a work. Okay? Another alternative that we might see out there are pictures and videos. And this is, again, goes along with our modern technology, our modern day and age, where we're... we're Again, we're kicking out the Word of God and we're implementing other strategies to see people believe in the Gospel. And this is out there. And a, this is a picture of a chick track. Okay? I know that uh, chick tracks are, can be very helpful to people's understanding of, of what the Scriptures say. And they can have their value. But as far as a a root level of what a trick track is and what it's doing to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about here, if we were just to take it at face value, think about the chick track and it, that is pictures. Mm -hmm. Do pictures save? No. Is that what the scriptures say? No. Pictures no. save. Mm -hmm. Do videos save? A motion picture? Mm -hmm. No. no. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. It says that the word of God mm -hmm. is necessary for salvation. Not pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I don't. I don't get on people's case. They use chick tracks. Okay. They they do have their impact in certain cases, and they have impacted people throughout the years. But I'm saying, related to our topic, as far as what I'm saying here, pictures don't save us. Mm -hmm. It's the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's why early on I said written words, mm -hmm. written words. Okay? It's what God has given us. Okay? God intended His written word to be the power of salvation, not pictures. Mm -hmm. Not a film production, not a motion picture. Mm -hmm. 
And then another one that I've noticed, and I've been preaching the gospel for many years, over a decade, and I've encountered many different uh, situations. As I've told guys when I was in college, you're walking with the adventures of David Warner here, okay? Because every time I went out, there was always some strange conversation that came out, that came out when I was talking with people, because there's some strange things out there. Another one is experience. Okay? And I'm serious. People will claim some experience in their life, maybe a miracle, a car crash, so to speak, or maybe surviving a serious surgery. I'm glad they survived it. But they take something like that, or a miracle that they saw, what they would term as a miracle, in their past, or they saw an angel, okay? Mm -hmm. Something like this. And they bank their salvation, their regeneration on that experience. Not the Word of God, on some experience. Mm -hmm. And this is out there. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter said in 2 Peter 1 that we have a more sure word of prophecy. No. He had an experience, and it was real, more than more real than what people experience today. Okay, it was real. He saw that, but he said that the word of prophecy is more sure than my experience. Believe that. Amen. Base your life on that, Amen. not the experience. Then you think about. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus in Luke 16. And the rich man says, Can you send Lazarus back to my relatives and tell them what they need to know? Can you warn them about this hell that I'm in? And Abraham says, No. They have Moses and the prophets. And that's good enough. That's good enough. They don't need someone to come back from the dead and tell them they have Moses and the prophets. They have enough. They have the written scriptures. And that's enough. <coughs> not experience. So experience does not save. Okay? Now I want to start concluding this by talking about 2 Timothy 3.15. So you can turn there. This is the second epistle that Paul is writing to Timothy. And this is towards the end of Paul's life. And he's pretty much getting Timothy ready, saying, Hey, I'm about to leave. And I'm not always going to be here. So let's get with the program. Okay? Let's get strong. Okay? And he says in verse 14, Look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Continue in these things. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Very plain there. What makes us wise unto salvation? It's the holy scriptures. Now I want to point some things out here though. You see the words hast known? Okay. Where is oidos? Which is a second perfect of Ido. And the perfect tense is saying that in the past, he began to understand and know these scriptures, and he kept knowing more and more and more and more and more. And he kept knowing these scriptures, understanding. And as he grew in his childhood into an adult, he understood more and more and more of the scriptures. He had a deep understanding of the scriptures. And this deep understanding of the scriptures makes us wise in the salvation. Okay? It gives us knowledge of the salvation that we're supposed to believe. And it's through faith in Christ Jesus. So it wasn't your five minute presentation. It was a deep understanding. This is what we're seeing all through this, the Bible is that the scriptures are expounded they're laid out 
so that we know what the gospel is through the scriptures. And he's telling Timothy, stick with this. Know this deeply, because there's people who are going to come to you, there's people out there who are going to run away from the faith, you need to stick with this. Do the work of the evangelist. Preach the word, okay? And they're supposed to know this. And he's supposed to stick with this and supposed to stand his ground, so to speak, with the scriptures that he's been told. And have this deep, and convey and pass down this deep understanding of the scriptures to people around him. Now, earlier I said, how important is a plant? We need plants, don't we? If we don't water a plant, it doesn't live. If it doesn't live, we don't have air. We don't have food. We don't have buildings. How important is the gospel? Very important. Another question. How important is the salvation of someone's soul? Amen. <clears throat> Very, very important. Yes. Uh, as, as much as important as a plant needs water, and we need plants, we need the gospel, and we need the word of God to be right with the gospel. Yeah. And so, the word of God is necessary for preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. Just like a plant needs water, okay? The word of God is necessary to preach the gospel. Amen. Thank you.